Death Metal, The Last Stories of the DC Universe Issue 1 finds Donna Troy waiting on a beach in Hellscape, soon met by Beast Boy, who asks why she is alone. Donna says that this was the beach that Steve Trevor washed up upon, and was the beach where Diana's life changed. She reveals that as Wonder Girl, she used to come to the beach in hopes that something would wash up for her and change her life and give her purpose, but nothing ever did. Garfield jokes about being the one who can wash up now and be her leading man, knowing a joke at the end of the world can't hurt. Like Donna, Garfield doesn't think it's the end of the world, but Donna knows the gods aren't listening to their prayers anymore. But if tonight is meant to be their last night on Earth, she wanted to make one last wish to the universe. She asks if it's silly and Gar knows that she's worried about what Diana said about preparing for war. Donna knows she definitely is worried and how can she not be since the League are lost now and Perpetua and the Darkest Night are fighting over who gets to finish them off. She knows the Trinity does have some sort of Hail Mary plan with Lex Luthor in the works, but Donna knows it's so much to take in, and while they have seen so much, they have never seen a crisis on this scale. She knows that when she joined the Titans, it wasn't about fighting bad guys or cosmic battles, she just wanted to hang out with kids her own age. Garfield knows all about that, having gathered all of the iterations of the Titans, planning on throwing a Titans party, and while it's not everyone who was in the Titans, he hoped that she'd like the spirit of it. Donna and Garfield go around and meet the teams before meeting with Dick and Garth, who found Dick leading the Justice League in a do or die mission. Donna knows all about his mission to Brimstone Bay and how he was riding a horse and wearing a new D&D costume. Dick says the moment he, Starfire and Cyborg step back on Themyscira, their costumes change back to normal. Donna is glad to see Dick back in his Nightwing costume and glad to see he's becoming his own man again, especially after everything that he and her have been through. Nightwing soon heads off, having been called to a meeting by Batman. Donna and Garth Mimo head back into the group, so wondering if they were ever as young as some of the heroes there. Suddenly there is a crackle of lightning as all of the heroes tense up, wondering what he is doing there. Donna wants to know what everyone is looking at and finds that it is Wally West who has arrived at the meeting. Elsewhere in what's left of Coast City, Hal Jordan visits the grave of his father. Hal is surprised to find his father's grave is still there, what with how twisted the world has become. He knows all of the other Lanterns wanted to be planning the coming battle or with the Titans, but he knows on his last night he wants one thing, just to fly again. He knows it might be a little selfish of him to be alone like this, but he needs to feel no fear right now. Heading to Ferris Airfield, he finds it a graveyard. He knows his dad flew and likes to think that the last thing he felt was freedom, the freedom Hal is looking for, but he knows better, knowing that his father felt fear and learned eventually everyone who flies falls. Hal heads to the Valley of the Rainbow Rings, walking through the thousands of Green Lantern rings without users. Soon, Sinestro joins him, wondering what Jordan expected to find in the valley. Sinestro expected Hal would be off joyriding in a green jet or in the arms of some exotic alien princess, not amongst the dead. Hal says he's in no mood to fight, and Sinestro thought that being this whole affair feels different, that maybe Hal would want to talk and help him with something. Hal knows exactly what he wants, and isn't too happy about it, especially after all of the pain the villain has caused him. Sinestro knows that, that it's how he started and it's how he wants to end, but Hal knows he doesn't deserve it. Sinestro understands, thinking that Hal is right and maybe some fear is what is needed right now. Sinestro goes to leave as Hal thinks maybe in the end his father did see the blue sky he was after and he needs to believe in that. Because of this thought, Hal summons up a green lantern ring, giving it to Sinestro, telling the man it's never too late for a second chance something he of all people should know. Taking the ring, Sinestro says the Green Lantern Oath once again, becoming a Green Lantern once more. He tells Hal he had forgotten how it feels to not be afraid, and he knows he won't say thank you to Hal, and Hal didn't expect him to, but he knows he could use some help. Sinestro wonders what with as the Green Lanterns take to the sky once again, with Hal saying that they are going to find out if there is any blue left up in the sky. Meanwhile, Wonder Woman remembers killing the Batman who laughs, cutting the villain in half with with her invisible chainsaw. Diana details the events to her mother, saying that in the end of it, she felt nothing. Hippolyta knows that she did what she did to
to save the world, and now she must prepare herself for the final task. Hippolyta, however, is aware that she did what she thought would end this, but Diana knows that thanks to Batman's plan, she won't fight for the salvation of the few. Having thrown down her sword when she saw it was the only thing standing between him and the slaughter of her sisters, Hippolyta knows that Diana is definitely her father's daughter, meaning it's all or nothing for her, but Diana knows she's nothing like Zeus. Leaving her mother, Diana reassures her that she will prepare for the night's end as she heads into the prison, where she is met by the Riddler, who says that it's been a very long time since they talked, knowing in fact they have actually never talked. Edward has a question for the woman, but Diana wonders why he's still there since he was freed. Edward says that his cell is probably the safest place instead of charging into certain death. Edward gives the hero a riddle, wondering what a creature whose greatest strength is their weakness is and who must fight for justice but also end justice. Diana gives up on solving it and the Riddler says the answer is a Wonder Woman, knowing Diana is ready to fight. Diana leaves the villain, descending into darkness where she tells the darkness she isn't ready, wondering if her triumphs have hobbled her. She wonders if that's why when she killed the Batman who laughs, she felt nothing because there was no victory there. Soon she is met by a Donna Troy from the multiverse, who reminds her that she is Wonder Woman. Donna says that with everything that's happened, she thinks that everyone is due an existential crisis, including Diana. Donna reveals that her world was a pit stop on the Batman Who Last's destruction path, and when her planet died after he was finished with it, she felt everything inside her collapse, resulting in her feeling like she was nothing. But she knows that it's all embedded inside her, every loss and soul who was ever killed on her planet, and it makes them who they are, and makes them superheroes. She knows Batman has his own personal torture, and for Wonder Woman, it's the pain of all the suffering, and when it comes to it, Diana will feel it all, and it's what drives her and all of them, and it's who they are. Diana goes to see what is left of her sisters under Themyscira, telling them that she is now ready for the coming battle, thanks to Donna's words. Above the hellscape, Green Arrow and Black Canary take in the destroyed Themyscira, wondering why the sun hasn't come up yet. The two talk about regrets, and if they have any, and Diana says she has one, an oath. Diana says that she would have liked to have an oath every time she's suited up thinking she's a little bit jealous of the lanterns for having one. Oliver quickly comes up with one as she asks him about his regrets. Oliver knows that she'll laugh, but he wishes he kind of got a first date with her, since they went from intense hatred of one another to deeply in love very fast. And while he's not complaining, he would have liked to have that nice memory in this terrifying time. Dinah talks about Themyscira and how it was quite majestic in its time, and how it was part library, gym, spa, and music and art but now it's a prison run by a Wonder Woman. Oliver knows that Diana did this to save lives, and Diana knows that, but Diana wanted to give people freedom. However, she ended up becoming their warden. Oliver wonders if Diana has talked to any of the refugees on the island yet, knowing that he met a Solomon Grundy who was born on a Tuesday. Diana says she's met some, specifically the Gloom Patrol from Planet Goth, knowing they are quite insufferable. Diana knows that she shouldn't make fun of them since Perpetua did destroy destroy their world, as Oliver takes off down the hill, knowing he owes her a proper date, taking her to the ration hut to secure some food before heading to the ocean front view he secured them. Heading down to the ocean, they try some of the food when they are attacked by two of the Jokerized sharks in the water. Black Canary quickly dispatches the sharks as they run away. Oliver had hoped for a nice beach stroll, having forgotten about the Black Fleet monsters that inhabit the waters around the island. Leaving the beach behind, Oliver asks Diana to promise him one thing, to stay behind in the morning. The woman knows that she can't do that, so Oliver decides that he will tackle the other regret he has. Getting down on one knee, Oliver delivers an oath, knowing that the thing that he said stands between him and the darkness is Diana, and always will be and has been. Diana thought that he was going to propose, and Oliver wonders if that would have been such a bad thing, which Diana knows it would have been, considering where they are, since when she's being asked to marry a man, she wants to be asked in a place of hope. Oliver is glad that he wasn't thinking that, as their moment is interrupted by a woman dressed like Oliver. The woman reveals that she is from another Earth, and she goes by the name Black Arrow, and is Oliver and Diana's daughter named Laurel. Laurel says that she doesn't want anything from them, but just wants to meet the heroes. Oliver hugs his daughter from another Earth, saying that she has her mother's eyes, as Laurel remembers on her Earth, Dinah was the Green Arrow, and Oliver was the Black Canary. Dinah 
Hannah meets with her multiversal daughter, who tells her that she is going to fight with them tomorrow and they cannot stop her. Black Canary knows, telling her to stay by her side and under her wing since she owes her world that. Dinah recites Oliver's oath about being the one between the darkness and them as she heads off with her daughter. Oliver says he'll catch up with them soon as he stays on the beach, looking over the ring he was going to give Dinah, knowing his regrets be damned. Out in the ocean, Aquaman takes to his former domain, knowing that he would rather be out there than on land on the eve of his death. He knows he doesn't fit in with the heroes anymore, seeing as they see him as the Admiral of the Black Fleet, a traitor to their kind and collaborator with their destroyers. Leaving a note for his son, Arthur knows he can't blame them, but he hopes they will understand why he did what he did. He knows to make good on his transgressions, he needs to do something greater than words would show. Diving into the deep of the ocean, Arthur knows he wants the heroes to know what drove him to this and what has now driven him to make a sacrifice. Sacrifice. Arthur heads to the bottom of the cold dark oceans, knowing the deal he made with Baphomet was to protect the sea and all its life and to preserve the world above, where the land dwellers fear death more than anything. The hero heads through the sunken cities of the dry land, knowing the people have hope and a belief that somehow what they will do will persist beyond them and shape those that come after. As he continues his journey through the waters, he comes across the giant bones of a blue whale, knowing all about the whale's life up until the day it stopped and the waters called her back home and carried her down to the next life, where her body became the seed of an entirely new life cycle. Following the whale's fall, Arthur casts off his black fleet armour, knowing his reign will pass down to his son Andy soon and all the things that he has done in his fight was to ensure that he would have a world to inherit. Speeding back up towards Towards the surface, Aquaman breaches the water, finding his son and wife waiting for him on the shore as his letter to Andy ends, telling his son to be good to his mother and to himself, knowing that he will gladly fall in battle because he cannot think of a better world than the one with him in it. Batman meanwhile meets with Batgirl, who wants Bruce to come and rest at her quiet camp she has set up. Bruce knows that Barbara has always been a leader, having underestimated her in the past and he wants to apologise for that, but the woman tells him to stop, knowing that they are already dead. Batman knows that they are and they can still keep fighting for the living since someone might live on, someone they love and he hopes it will be her since the end is just the beginning. Bruce tells Barbara that he does need some rest, wanting her to gather the boys. Gathering Tim from a card game with Killer Croc, Magpie and Despero and Jason from Mara, the weapons master, Barbara goes searching for Dick, finding him taste testing food made by the son of a chef who served the Batman of Earth 45. Barbara thinks that Dick looks like quite the snack in his chef's outfit, making the man wonder if she's flirting with him, as he learns that they are to go and meet with Bruce. Dick, however, wants a minute alone with Barbara, knowing that there isn't much time to say what he wants to. Dick shows her a sprig of rosemary, saying that it reminds him of Barbara, knowing her smell is intoxicating, but Barbara knows that there is no time for this, not needing a scent to remind her of how much Dick hurt her feelings. Dick says that he's trying to apologize for what he did since this might be their last chance to tell her that he loves her, but Barbara wants him to keep it to himself since she doesn't need emotional bombs thrown at her right now. Meeting with the Bat family, Batman says that he'll skip to the end since that's what's important here, asking if they have all got what they need to get the job done. The family show what little they have found around the place, from food to batarangs and bullets, all pooling it together. Batman knows that they are all ready for a fight, hoping to see them on on the other side as he realizes that while the family thinks that he fathered them, it was the kids that fathered him, having taught him more than he could ever learn outside of the family, making them a family of true dark nights. Barbara sets up a tent, knowing that they need to rest as Dick returns to try and talk to her again, knowing they can't put this off any longer. Again, Barbara refuses to have this conversation with the man as Batman comes to them, telling them to skip to the end where this is all resolved since he needs them to be focused. Dick agrees, telling Barbara to marry him, which while she guesses that, that is where this will eventually end, she doesn't think Dick thought like that. Batman uses his non-existent power as Batman to officiate the wedding, marrying the two heroes as he leaves with Jason to give the newlyweds some space. Barbara decides that if they want, they can be married for just tonight, and if they survive the battle tomorrow, then it'll be over between them.
in them. Dick agrees, knowing that he will win Barbara back, since he'll have a lifetime ahead of him to try. Nightwing and Batgirl kiss as Batman knows that they all fight together, and in his heart, that is their true victory. At the destroyed Fortress of Solitude, Superman restarts his diary entry, knowing tomorrow, Earth's defenders embark on a suicide mission, knowing for the people of Earth to live, they must die. Clark knows that he has a decision to make, knowing that he should be spending time with John and Lois, saying his farewells, but even now, with everything lost, 7 billion people are afraid that this is their last day on Earth, with half shutting down in terror and the other half surrendering to the anarchy. He knows choosing between them and his family is impossible, but he doesn't believe in the impossible. Thanks to his son's damaged 31st century time bubble, Clark scraps it for parts and invents a device that, once coupled with some rare Kryptonium elements, will allow him to move back through time one hour. Donning his old costume, Superman activates the chronal device, going back in time one hour in order to help people, knowing while his friends are concentrating on keeping the peace, he chooses a different path. His hour soon runs out after helping fix it a bridge, so risking everything, Clark activates the watch again, making another Superman who begins helping out again. But he knows that's not enough, activating the watch again and again, knowing until the time shift gives out, he can keep using it for 10 times or a thousand times. Thanks to this, Superman knows that for the first and last time in his life, for one hour, he can be everywhere he is needed, to pull people out of their despondence and to make them feel less alone and give them the confidence in the future they deserve. The watch begins to disintegrate as Superman helps more and more people, getting to spend time with Perry and Jimmy and bringing hope all around the world. Pulled out of the timeline and back to the present after the watch is destroyed, Clark meets with his wife and son. He knows that in the thousands of hours in the timeline he had, he came up with the right words, telling them that he doesn't expect to return from the battle tomorrow. As the people around the world get ready for tomorrow, Superman knows that he and his family will make the most of it, taking to the skies one final time. Back at the Titans party in the hellscape, Wally is confronted by Donna telling her that if he's not welcome, he understands and will leave, knowing what he did, but he has to tell her something. Donna hugs her friend, knowing he doesn't need to say anything since they all know. She brings Wally into the party as the different groups begin to all feel lost and hopeless. Donna knows that that's not what being a Titan is, as Beast Boy wishes he had got to be on the Justice League. Cyborg knows the League never got to be Titans if that's any constellation, and Donna jokes that they couldn't even handle it. Donna tells the Gather teams that the Justice League could never be able to hack being a Teen Titan, since ever since they were kids growing up, they have been against the same challenges as the League, and now on the eve of their greatest battle, they are all cowering in fear. She wants them to think about what the universe has put them through, but how through it all, the Titans come back, no matter what, because when you fight one Titan, you fight them all. The heroes celebrate Donna's speech, all joking around with one another as Garth calls for Donna's attention. Donna learns that Batman has arrived, using his Black Lantern ring to raise an army of the dead, which now includes Roy Harper. He says he wasn't going to miss out on this fight with his friends. As he silently acknowledges Wally, the storms around them begin, signalling the end, so Donna rallies the heroes, telling them of the wish she made on the beach earlier, knowing that they aren't just teams, they are families, and if this is their last night, there is only one thing that she could wish for, that they could all do this together. Death Metal, The Last Stories of the DC Universe Issue 1 was another really fantastic anthology collection from Death Metal, all based around the premise that this is the eve of battle and we find out what certain heroes are up to and how characters are dealing with their probably impending death. I thoroughly enjoyed all of the stories showcased here, from Aquamans to Green Arrows to Batmans to Supermans, all perfectly wrapped up in a Donna Troy-centric story which brought together all of the Teen Titans and Titans adjacent teams for one last hurrah before the end. I have to say seeing Roy Harper again, albeit as a zombie, was a real total surprise and I really enjoyed the small silent moment he got with Wally, kind of acknowledging what happened and realising that it wasn't all Wally's fault. Again, it's kind of undoing everything that Heroes in Crisis did and 
what they did to mess up the characters so much. The Superman story was a huge highlight for me as well, being that Mark Waid returned to the character and wrote the character as if he never left, letting the hero do the impossible and prove that yet again in complete darkness and in the darkness of the death metal world, he is still a shining beacon of hope. Much like the other anthologies of death metal, I have adored all of these stories we got here and can't wait for the remaining death metal issues as well as the last couple of anthologies we have coming our way. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10. A 10.